Dear ladies and gentlemen, дорогі українці, we continue our dialogues on the war which started together with Russian invasion on Ukraine. This is already episode number 17 in our series of conversations. We are discussing here different aspects to share this knowledge with you, our listeners, who are keen to learn more, think deeper, and hear from the original sources. І ми продовжуємо наші діалоги про війну, що розпочалися разом із вторгненням Росії в Україну. Це вже 17-й епізод нашої серії розмов. Ми обговорюємо тут різні аспекти, щоб поділитися цими знаннями із вами, нашими слухачами, що прагнуть дізнатися більше, думати глибше та чути із перших джерел. This is a project of Pen Ukraine, who are in Ukraine right now, fighting for their freedom and indeed their very lives under the continuing Russian invasion. We express our support and admiration for their dedication and commitment, as well as for the indefatigable spirit of all Ukrainians who are fighting today. As you might know, many PAN members volunteer now. We also want to help them with our online events. For instance, now Helena Krug, our member and vice president of PAN Ukraine, poet and translator in Peaceful Life, fundraises for the purpose of drugs and tactical medicine for field hospitals vital for Ukrainians who are protecting themselves and their country today. You can find all the details in the comments. Please donate to help. Це проєкт українського пену, члени якого зараз перебувають в Україні, борються за свою свободу, а власне і за своє життя під загрозою триваючого вторгнення. Ми в чергове висловлюємо нашу підтримку та захоплення вашою самовідданістю і невтомним духом усіх українців, що продовжують свою боротьбу. Як ми, ймовірно, знаєте, сьогодні багато членів ПЕН є волонтерами. І ми також хочемо допомогти їм через наші онлайн-заходи. Зокрема, зараз Галина Крук, наша членкиня і віце-президентка ПЕН Україна, поетеса і перекладачка у мирному житті, збирає кошти на закупівлю ліків і тактичної медицини для польових госпіталів, життєво необхідних для українців, які сьогодні захищають себе і свою країну. Ви можете знайти усі деталі в коментарях. Будь ласка, зробіть свою пожертву, щоб допомогти сьогодні. The project is co-hosted by Pan International, which has continued to provide a platform for freedom of expression for those currently under the highest risk. We work under the Pan International Charter. Співорганізатором проєкту є міжнародний ПЕН, який продовжує надавати платформу для вираження свободи поглядів для тих, хто перебуває в групі найвищого ризику. Ми дотримуємося хартії міжнародного ПЕН. We are grateful to our partners for today. It's Atlantic Council and traditionally Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, British Council, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute, and the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. We are streaming today's event to all partners' Facebook pages. Ми вдячні нашому нинішньому партнеру Atlantic Council та постійним партнерам Pan America, Українському інституту, Українському інституту Лондона, Україна Світ, Британській Раді, Українському науково-дослідному інституту Гарвардського університету та інституту Гаррімана при Колумбійському університеті. Ми транслюємо сьогоднішню подію на всі партнерські сторінки у Facebook. Захід відбувається англійською мовою. And I will switch into English to introduce our guest for today. Ірина Славінська, Ukrainian journalist, presenter, translator, literary scholar, public figure, feminist, a jury member of BBC Book of the Year Award, a teacher of modern Ukrainian literature and 19th, 20th century European literature, and an expert in the investigation of stealing and frauds at the Ukrainian art market. Art market. I believe Irina has something to share about this angle of ongoing invasion as well, on the losses and risks that culture and mass media in Ukraine face today as a result of military aggression of the, by the Russian Federation. I will quote the keynote speech for Writers in Prison Committee annual meeting delivered by Ostap Slavinsky, Vice President of Pan Ukraine a few days ago. Yes, Ukraine's freedom, including freedom of expression, freedom of self-identification as a nation and society, is under fire today. We will really appreciate your opinion on it, dear Irena. I remember your amazing 33 Heroes of Ukrlit, Ukrainian literature, and other projects about inspiring Ukrainian people, and I believe now you have a lot of material to proceed with it. And Irina will speak today with Melina, Melinda Herring. She is a top expert on Ukraine, 
and the deputy director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Previously, she was the editor of the Atlantic Council's popular publication, the Ukraine Alert blog. She's the author of the reports, Reforming the Democracy Bureaucracy, co-author of Biden and Ukraine and Biden and Belarus, a strategy for the next administration, Ukraine's internationally displaced persons hold key to peace, and a contributor to Does Democracy Matter? And this is our question to ask ourselves today, especially to ask Melinda, who managed democracy assistance program in Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Russia. I ask a lot of my colleagues from international organizations and NGOs, do you feel like our efforts on Russia failed? Melinda is also a member of the supervisory board of Right to Protection in Kiev. And we are going to speak about it today as well. Dear ladies, the floor is yours. Super, thank you so much, Alha. It's really a pleasure to be here. Arena and I are really delighted to do this, uh, to have a conversation. We've never met each other before. We're not sure how this is possible. So Zoom actually brings us together. Um, Irina, I, I think I wanted to start uh, with, with just an obvious question. So uh, in, the war is terrible and it's awful and we're entering week seven, but the world is finally paying attention and realizing that Ukraine is different and it has a different identity and culture than Russia. What are some big titles, some authors that you would recommend to people who are new to Ukrainian literature? Uh, one that I, I love and am reading right now is The Orphanage by Sergei Zhadon, a Kharkiv-based writer, and this is really well translated. I've been really impressed. Who, who are some other writers and titles that you would recommend. Hello, I'm really happy to, happy to be here and to have this opportunity to talk with you and our listeners and viewers. So thank you so much for starting our conversation with this contemporary literature topic. And I totally agree with you that it is very important to read the uh, Srihi Jadan to understand uh, modern Ukraine. And uh, I see him uh, really as one of the mm, best voices of our, our generation. Uh, he was and he is writing about uh, this war experience uh, since uh, since 2014, and I think his words and his poems are very helpful, personally for me to understand more about this uh, Russian offensive in 2022. Another very important voice uh, to understand Ukraine is of course Oksana Zabushko. She is uh, her books uh, are translated into English, and I think it's quite easy to find it online. Mm -hmm. Another important voice uh, for me personally is uh, the novels by Andriy Kurkov. Uh, it's quite uh, a phantasmagoric, maybe it's not very realistic, but I think uh, it can um, help to understand a little bit um, a kind of absurd of uh, the contemporary life. And also it's funny, and I think his books uh, can bring more light humor, and it's very important for these days. And another very important book I would like to mention, and it's also translated into English, is of course uh, the book by Stanislav Isayev, mm -hmm. um, the ex-prisoner of so-called DNR, uh, Russian, Russian baker separatists. So it's called The Torture Camp on Paradise Street. And it is his memoir about uh, being prisoner, all this, uh, Actually, maybe it would be, uh, be quite violent to say so, but he was a prisoner of this Russian butchers uh, torturing Ukrainian people. And uh, I appreciate a lot of this memoir by Stanislav. And I was very, very impressed uh, when uh, we met each other in person and he impressed me. And I think uh, things uh, he is writing about is very important to understand our enemy and also to understand the greatness of person uh, who is able to survive this kind of experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I met him in February before the war started, uh, and he speaks with, uh, you know, a lot of dignity and strength. And, you know, you write down every word he says because uh, he feels that he's been there. Um, on Oksana Zhabushka, which, where would you start? So I have to confess, I was really excited to uh, buy her books. I went to Amazon and I bought one uh, and it's about 700 pages or 800 pages long. It's very dense. Uh, maybe I picked the wrong one. Where would you start with Oksana Zhabushka? Actually, maybe I need to check uh, which of her books uh, are translated into English. But of course, uh, I would uh, recommend uh, maybe one of uh, her um, earlier books, Polygidus Lidzhenia Ukrainskoho Sexus, or Field uh, 
uh, research on Ukrainian sex. Uh, it's not about the war, but it's about the experience of being Ukrainian woman. And I think it's very important to have this gender perspective to understand this uh, uh, days in Ukraine and, uh, for example, the events in Bucha with a lot and Borodyanka uh, and Repinian Gostomel and all the other cities uh, being liberated from Russian occupants shows that uh, women issue are so important um, during this war and it is very important to pay attention to women issue, especially to such war crimes as, of course, um, sex sexual aggression against Ukrainian women. Yeah, say more about that, Irina, because uh, if you haven't lived in Ukraine uh, or spent a lot of time with Ukrainians, I think it's in a point that we we don't see very clearly in the West. So Ukrainian women are, are special. They're, they're very different. They hold a lot of roles in society. They're expected to take care of the children. They're expected to work. They're expected uh, to be beautiful. They're expected to make money uh, and have a clean house. Uh, you know, the role is is all encompassing. Uh, and during the war, uh, they were able to leave and take their children, but a lot of them have stood behind. Say, say more about uh, the role that women, uh, or what you saw in, in Bucha. I know there were, there were um, was it mostly women our age or older women that, that were victims? What, what can you say about the women that, that we know so far there? Unfortunately, we are seeing very, very clear that Russian soldiers are targeting uh, civil, uh, civilians and a lot of them uh, are women and uh, women with children, for example. And unfortunately, we see that uh, one of the weapons uh, Russian soldiers are using, it is the sexual aggression. So we see a lot of cases of mass uh, rape uh, of Ukrainian women uh, by Russians. It's quite hard to talk about it. Uh, I was I had my heart broken after first uh, photos from Bucha. And uh, I think it's a kind of uh, maybe national trauma will need to survive and to think more. And of course, to punish all these people uh, committing such crimes against women. But speaking about a more broader context, it's uh, very important to understand uh, one thing about uh, Mm, Ukrainian gender context. Uh, a lot of things changed after 2014, after Euromaidan, after our revolution of dignity. Um, we had even this kind of slogan, uh, the half of Maidan, speaking about women presented, uh, pre present on Maidan and taking part of this, uh, on these events. Uh, so it wasn't uh, surprising to see more women participating in parliament, for example, as MPs and being uh, working um, on, on the Ukrainian government. And of course, after the war started in 2014, after Russian occupation of Crimea and uh, some uh, Donetsk and Lugansk region district started, it was a lot of women uh, willing to serve in the Ukrainian army. Mm -hmm. And maybe our, our army <laughs> wasn't ready for this uh, idea yet, but a uh, very fast uh, army adopted itself. And now it's a quite better place uh, to serve if you, are, if you are a woman and a soldier at the same time. So now in 2024, we see very different social context. We mm. see a lot of brave women uh, fighting with weapons in their arms, but also fighting on the diplomatic front line, on the political front line, and also being, I would say, just mothers uh, uh, with their families. And, they are also very brave, and I even cannot imagine the hell uh, mothers from Bucha, Borodyanka, Irpinga, Stomil, and other cities uh, survive. Yeah, that's a really important point, uh, the, the change in society since 2014 to now. Uh, and also, Irina, there, was, there were legislative changes. There were a number of careers that were off limits for women, just based on gender alone. You couldn't drive a subway train, which is totally ridiculous. The old Soviet legislation said it might interfere with your reproductive responsibilities or something crazy like that. You know, apparently, you can't have a baby and drive a, drive a subway train. Um, you know, there were, I think there was a list of about 100 different careers that were off limits, and partly rescinded that and changed that. So I, I think you're you're right. There, there is, and you're the first Ukrainian woman I've ever heard who identifies as a feminist. That to me is a, a revelation. You know, that, that shows you that society uh, is definitely changing. Um, are I was there... the first actually, ex, ex, excuse me to interrupt you, but uh, 
I would like to say that there is a lot of Ukrainian women identifying themselves as a feminist. Maybe it wasn't uh, such, imp such important before our conversation or before this actual war context. But since uh, the Ukrainian independence started, we had uh, actually a very large group of Ukrainian feminists presenting themselves and speaking about themselves about, uh, as feminists. Uh, these women work in uh, as first uh, MPs of the first Ukrainian parliament uh, uh, in 1901. Uh, uh, they were doing uh, a very important work also with Ukrainian legislation. Of course, it wasn't ideal, uh, we had uh, to change a lot of things, but uh, these uh, women uh, as first uh, ministers or MPs uh, or just activists and writers and so on uh, were creating the a uh, whole context for us, for our contemporary work uh, with the gender issues. So do you feel like there are, are, are there any legal or societal prohibition on, on what women can do now in Ukraine? After the revolution of dignity and after the war now, do you feel like uh, Ukrainian women can do anything they want or are there still areas that are um, limited to them? It is very important to understand that uh, the context is quite complex. So speaking about uh, law, about legislation, uh, I would say um, we are living in one of the best life we could uh, be in Ukrainian women. Uh, but of course, there is a lot of social context uh, we need to change. Um, there are some gender stereotypes and so on, but it seems it is the same in any country of the world. Maybe American women are facing uh, the same challenges than Ukrainian women. Hmm. Is the group of feminists that you described organized or is it more uh, ad hoc? Um, you know, uh, feminism, it's a very large issue in any country. So we can see some groups of feminists and uh, some groups of women working together and identifying themselves in fem as feminists, but working with legislation or in journalism. Speaking about uh, the current war context, for example, it is very important to understand that in the Ukrainian army on the front line, we have a lot of uh, soldiers fighting together and uh, they are men and women fighting together. Also, I have some colleagues uh, from media who now are fighting as a part of territorial defense forces, for example. So my colleagues were journalists and they are still journalists, but now they are uh, putting on polls, they are journalistic work and uh, they are doing everything they can uh, be in the part, uh, a part of territorial defense forces. So. Yeah, Irina, I think that's an important point. The war is going to continue to break down any remaining barriers. So before um, before February 24th, like you said, more Ukrainian women were fighting in the Ukrainian army. They changed their rules, but there were still some problems. The Ukrainian army hadn't updated some like obvious things. They didn't have gynecologists on the front lines to take care of women. They were buying backpacks that were meant for men and they were too big and they were giving women back pain. Uh, and activists in Ukraine were trying to change that. But I, I think now uh, those things are going to be changed. You know, there, there's there's no time uh, to, to, to foot drag. So I, th I think those things will be changed. And I also have to say Ukraine is so capably represented here in Washington by a wonderful female leader, uh, Ambassador Oksana Markarova. Uh, she's the best ambassador Ukraine has ever had in the United States, hands down, easy. And then also on the international stage, we see on CNN, the chief correspondent that, uh, is Clarissa Ward, another, another woman. So, you know, I think the world is changing, thank God. And also maybe it's very important to mention the leader of Voice uh, of America here in uh, Ukraine, Voroslava Gongadze. Absolutely. She's doing such a great job. And uh, I think if we would like to list, uh, to make a list of all these brilliant uh, Ukrainian women working together to dreaming about our victory uh, during these difficult days, this list would be quite long. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. So my friend Vladislav Davidison, who is uh, partly Ukrainian, he was the editor of the Odessa Review for a long time. He made a really interesting observation, Arena. He said uh, that this war has brought in uh, some of the top Ukrainian artists. Some of the top Ukrainian artists have put down their pens, their cameras, and they're fighting. Uh, and I hadn't thought of it that way. Can you say more uh, about that? How is the artistic community uh, responding to the war? And, and uh, if they're not fighting, how are they resisting and helping the, the cause? 
The Ukrainian artistic community are responding, uh, responding in any possible way. So you can see a, a very big uh, specter of uh, different choices. For example, we've talked uh, just before our uh, conversation, uh, our public part of conversation started about Andrei Flevnuk from Boombox and about his uh, hit song made uh, revive, <laughs> revived with Pink Floyd. So or with the Chirvona Kalina and uh, I think uh, the whole world uh, now can sing this line from uh, this uh, famous and well-known uh, Ukrainian song. So Andriy Hlevniuk, as uh, any, a lot of other Ukrainian artists uh, are, uh, are fighting in the Ukrainian army or in territorial defense forces. So we were talking also about Stanislav Asyev, and now he is a part of territorial defense forces in Brovary and the town he is living. Um, Another issue and another uh, strategy to uh, work and to be present uh, during this war days is, of course, to work, to work as a volunteer, like Sergei Zhadan in uh, Kharkiv. He's doing a lot uh, as a volunteer. He's helping uh, and he's providing with all this, uh, all the medical supplies, for example, people in need. He knows that uh, Kharkiv is in a very uh, difficult situation now. Uh, there is a lot of bombings every day and uh, Russian forces being so close to Kharkiv. So it's important to um, the city to be supported. And I think it's very important to have uh, people like Sergei Zhadan to be their voice, to help uh, to raise awareness to the city. And it is um, very um, useful for fundraising. And also it's very useful for the moral uh, context. So people are feeling uh, one of our contemporary classic being with them and uh, living the same life they are living. Uh, also, I would like to mention another perspective, of course, our um, artists are, work are working a lot as uh, voices of Ukraine. So they are providing comments and interviews and participating in any kinds of public events to present the Ukrainian point of view and the Ukrainian perspective. And uh, I think it's not surprising that our artists are being so active in this context. So um, you can uh, remember, for example, the context of the First World War or the Second World War, or for example, the context of uh, the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian Narodna Respublika, Ukrainian Popular Republic, uh, being destroyed by Bolshevik in uh, 22. Uh, and I was thinking a lot about uh, brilliant Ukrainian artists taking part in this uh, historical events. And now I understand very much why, for example, the Ukrainian poetry of this period uh, was so brilliant, mm. because brilliant poets and writers and other artists uh, were taking part in this uh, fights and in this war, uh, in this wars. And now these days in 2022, I see the same brilliant artist. Hmm. Taking so you're predicting, in. you're predicting a, re a renaissance here. Uh, I, I've been talking about uh, the coming Ukrainian renaissance, uh, but more political and economic. Um, and I hadn't even thought of this. This is a really interesting point. So you think that out of this war, we're going to see uh, more Ukrainian writers and poets write their sort of great pieces and maybe filmmakers as well. I think our renaissance uh, already started uh, maybe a few years before uh, this uh, Russian offensive started. And uh, it is very easy to see, um, for example, um, watching uh, the newest Ukrainian films mm -hmm. like Rhinoceros, uh, Rino, or um, by Alexinsov, for example, or like uh, novels uh, by Sergei Zhadan, and mm -hmm. like uh, all this interesting Ukrainian uh, drama um, uh, written by Natalia Vorostoit and other artists. And it's very important not to uh, let it go. I hope <laughs> the Russians will go home if I can say so, and uh, we'll have this possibility to continue our work with uh, our Ukrainian Renaissance. Yeah, I hope so too. I think there will be a flourishing and that flourishing will continue. Um, there's also been a really interesting movement. Um, it's called, so the 
Guardian newspaper just did a, a big article on it. It's called Spend with Ukraine. And it's an effort for, so Ukraine has a lot of creative types, not only uh, visual artists and, and musical artists and literary artists, it also has a hugely um, in, inventive fashion scene, a, an inventive tech scene, an inventive food scene. So a lot of people are out of work right now. So some really um, smart people built a website. It's called Spend with Ukraine. Arena, I don't know if you'd have, had a chance to look at it. But it's a way that people in the West can get online and they can buy uh, they can buy clothes, they can buy shoes, they can buy hats uh, from Ukraine. And they're they're great design. I, I think it's it's brilliant. Um, you know, we have we have a barrier with language. A lot of people who feel uh, like they want to do something to help Ukraine, you know, they can't uh, necessarily understand Ukrainian language. So films are a little bit harder unless there's subtitles. Uh, and some of the titles you mentioned are not well translated, um, but Jadon is very well translated. Um, and then Andre's books are well translated. Uh, Zhabushka is not very well translated, I have to tell you. Uh, I, I, I could not get through that book. Uh, so I think there's some work to do on the translation side. Uh, do you any, any comments on, on this initiative to, to get uh, Westerners uh, to discover uh, sort of the creative cool part of Ukraine? Have you had a chance to look at Spend with Ukraine or any of those websites? I guess that just a very small look on this initiative and uh, but I think it's quite natural to in invite people to invest uh, or just buy Ukrainian things but maybe I would be more serious here and uh, in my point from my point of view it's very important also to gather initiatives to support Ukraine in some more concrete way it's very yes. important to see the results of the support absolutely yes support ukrainian fashion is very important but now in this context maybe more important is to sign is to sign a kind of petition to governments or mps and asking and demanding them to provide or to help to provide more weapons to ukraine so it's very important to talk about fashion, but it's very, it's also very important to talk about weapons and about arms supplies to Ukraine because it's impossible to fight Russian occupants with fashion or books. Absolutely, absolutely, and I've been doing that for seven weeks. Uh, you know, there comes to a point though when people uh, reach a point where they can't give more. Uh, you know, and a lot of people are reaching that point that they've just given as much money as they can. So here in the United States, we've been raising a lot of money for Razum in New York. It's it's a charity that we know and trust, and they're sending medical assistance, and they're they're brilliant. Uh, we've been calling our congressmen, we've been calling the White House, and telling them get the weapons there now. Um, we've been hosting local fundraisers. Um, people are working in Orthodox churches to send assistance to Ukraine. Uh, I have a giant Ukrainian flag outside, um, you know, of my house. My entire neighborhood neighborhood is mobilized you know people uh, and I'm it's there's there's hundreds of thousands of people like me who are doing this kind of work we got your back um but I, I think that the fashion bit is one more way to reach um you know people who are not into Ukraine and don't know anything about the country and, and that, that's the only reason I brought it up I thought it was a, a creative way to reach another group of of people um in America in Britain who, who might be able to help um, you know, yes, and, of and course. want to do something. And for example, it's very important to mention the great work of the Ukrainian fashion, for example, uh, with uh, its brilliant leader, uh, Irina Domovanolevska. And uh, these guys are, do are doing a lot of brilliant work and were doing a lot of brilliant work uh, before Russian offensive started. And now I think uh, that they are also very important to help the fashion industry industry to be aware about the war in Ukraine and also maybe to help um, ordinary people to maybe to buy something or to look at something beautiful and to think more about Ukraine. So I'm not thinking that fashion is not important. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's just one more way to, 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 to educate people and get them interested, right? Ukrainian fashion designers have been in vogue uh, at least 12 times. And I think it also speaks to the, the, the real creative potential in Ukraine. You know, mo most people don't really give Ukraine a whole lot of attention. So, you know, that's one of the ironies is Ukraine is finally getting the international attention it deserves for horrific reasons. Um, you talked a little bit earlier, Irina, about the heaviness of this moment. You know, the images we're seeing out of Bucha, we were talking about this before we started. I can't sleep, I know you can't sleep either. Uh, and, you know, we're both very, very disturbed by this and the Ukrainian people are as well. 
Um, can you tell me a little bit more, though, what ways is culture being used in Ukraine to sustain people's spirits in spite of this horrific moment? I saw an article in the New York Times this morning that said that the Lviv Opera is starting to, to, to uh, give shows again. And it said that it has to cap the number of seats to 250 because they can only fit 250 people in the bomb shelter below. Uh, what, what other uh, ways are you seeing that, that art can sustain our spirits in this horrific time? I admired a lot the work of um, our gallery uh, called Parahid um, Vagabundo in Ivano Frankivsk. Uh, this is one of the cities uh, receiving people from other Ukrainian regions uh, who needed to uh, uh, go, go away from their houses and to find something new uh, in, the, in Western Ukraine, for example. And um, this gallery, Parahid Vagabundo, um, was um, Yuri Andrukhovich and other important Ukrainian artists are working a lot uh, with children, for example. They are working as a bomb shelter and in the same time they are providing different activities to help uh, children to get um, adapted to uh, this kind of a new, new reality. Um, another interesting issue from Ivana Frankivsk is um, their um, theater, Ivano, uh, Ivano Franco drama, uh, drama theater with uh, Rostislav Dushipilsky as uh, their main uh, director. And uh, they are playing uh, dramas in their bomb shelter because they uh, also they have a bomb shelter providing uh, the possibility to hide uh, to the local people from Ivano Frankivsk. And uh, it was very interesting to know that uh, they are uh, playing uh, their shows uh, so underground in this bomb shelter. I, I think it's quite a, an interesting initiative. It uh, helps uh, to use the Ukrainian culture to help people morally, but also to provide them support of a very um, concrete way. So given, given them the possibility to be in a shelter and uh, to be protected. Irina, have you seen any uh, avant-garde theater come out uh, of the last seven weeks? Are, are any of the most famous playwrights uh, hard at work on, on plays that are based in, in shelters or is it too soon for something like that? Maybe it's too soon, but I'm not sure. Um, I was very touched. Uh, so it's not the, the, the answer on your question, but I would like to, to tell the story of Natalia Voroshbet. Uh, she's a very famous Ukrainian playwright and uh, she needed uh, she needed to, um, to leave uh, her home and uh, she was writing a very touching text about uh, being in another city and living a uh, house with having only a few minutes to understand which objects uh, she would like to take with her. And I think it would publish it for in, in the Guardians and uh, maybe it, it will be very easy to find. And, uh, I'm not sure that Natalia Vorosbyt uh, is ready to write something as a playwright, for example. But maybe um, another text uh, will come out. But also speaking about um, interesting artistic initiatives, I would like to mention the, a book uh, by Larissa Donosenko, a very famous Ukrainian writer, and uh, she is also a lawyer. And uh, Larissa um, has a book uh, called uh, Maya and Her Two Mothers. And it was write, uh, written in Ukrainian um, five years ago. And now this book is translated uh, into different languages, English too. And it, it, seems it was published in Great Britain. And uh, this book now is working as uh, one of the instruments of fundraising because uh, um, any sales of this book uh, will uh, raise funds to help Ukrainian children. And I think it's very beautiful as an initiative. And also it's a great book. <laughs> What was the title? I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, Maya the Yamama, so Maya and her mothers. Okay, okay, super. Uh, if someone can put that in the, the chat so that other people could see it, that would be fantastic. Uh, I have another question uh, that, that came into my mind as we were talking. So um, there's a huge number of internally displaced Ukrainians, Arena, people from the Donbass in particular, people from uh, places that have been hard hit, have moved to Lviv, they've moved to Western Ukraine, they've moved to Poland. Uh, but a lot of people are, are internally displaced. I think it's more than 6 million and they wanna stay in Ukraine. And there's been a mixing. So Ukraine has these distinct regions. Um, what do you think is gonna happen as a result of the war? I've heard lots of sort of anecdotal stories of people from Lviv 
leave meeting people from the Donbass for the first time? Do you think that, that how is that going to change Ukrainian identity, this sort of mixing and, and more contact between regions? I think it's very important to remember that the war started in 2014. So this uh, first possible surprise of meeting somebody from other region uh, has already happened. And now I think it's very important to understand that there are a lot of people uh, who lost their houses mm. for the second time. Mm. I have a friend from Mariupol, so actually she's from Donetsk, uh, Diana Berg. She's a great artist and designer and cultural activist. She was taking part in um, the Euromaidan in uh, Donetsk. Uh, then she had to move to Mariupol after the Russian occupation in Donetsk started. And now she, need, she needed to uh, leave Mariupol. Mm -hmm. And it is the second time uh, she lost their, uh, her home uh, because of Russians. I think this uh, part of story is very important to be told. It is the same thing with my colleagues from Crimea. Uh, I used to work in a newsroom uh, with, a few colleague, with a few colleagues from Crimea and uh, they need to, uh, to go from Kerch and uh, Bakhchisarai and other cities to start their work in Kiev or in Lviv or other cities. And now some of them uh, need to leave again. For me, it's very painful to think about but unfortunately, the reality of a lot of journalists, but other Ukrainians too. Yeah, and I think it's important to say they've lost their house twice in the last 10 years. Uh, you know, put that, that cap on it, less than 10 years. Uh, that, that, it's, it's shocking. Uh, tell me more, Irina, about what artists can do in the United States, in Britain, in Western Europe to help. Do you think it's a good idea for them to speak out, to give concerts, to come to Ukraine? What would you recommend? From my point of view, any kind of support is important. Uh, maybe the most, the most important is the support to help uh, governments to give more weapons and arms supplies to Ukraine, because it's impossible to fight Russians by hands. We need to have more weapons to do it more effective. And uh, another uh, support which can be very useful is uh, the support of speaking more about Ukraine and also about understanding more about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Ukraine, unfortunately, is a country being uh, for quite a long time a colony of Russia and uh, it affected a lot the understanding of the Ukrainian culture and the Ukrainian language. Even now, a lot of um, conferences and roundtables about the Ukrainian situation are happening uh, even without a uh, inviting any Ukrainian in the part of this conversation. Very often uh, people think that uh, specialists in Russia culture can be enough, um, effective enough as specialists on Ukrainian culture. And it's very important to understand it's, uh, it is very diff different and also to understand the necessity of uh, this post-colonial lens to understand the Ukrainian context. I'm happy to say that that has changed uh, it's at least changed in Washington. So there's a recognition that there's a big difference between Ukraine experts and Russia experts. Uh, and I think Ukrainian experts are, from Ukraine are better well known. Uh, and at the Atlantic Council, we make a real point of including uh, Ukrainians in our discussions. And I think more and more think tanks are, um, you know, and you're right that the disciplines, you know, the political science disciplines around Russian and East European studies have always been focused on Russia. And most think tanks in Washington are Russia focused. We at the Atlantic Council are proud to be Ukraine focused. Uh, you know, we Ukraine is the heart and soul of our work. It always will be. So uh, I think the world is waking up, you know, and, and Harvard has a fabulous uh, Ukrainian studies program. I think that's going to change. Uh, and more and more, I think students who are entering graduate school are going to choose to, to study Ukrainian rather than Russian. So let's see. I, I, I think there is going to be a renaissance of Ukrainian studies in, in interest 
uh, in Ukraine, a very strong interest in the, in the United States. One of the problems though, Arena, uh, is, is that there's not very many good books about Ukraine for a general reader. So, you know, a lot of the titles that we've talked about, Jadon, um, you know, Zhabushka, I'm sorry, most people are not gonna read them. My mother is not gonna read them. The one book that my mother will read um, is this, it's The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine by Sergei Plohi. This book is great and it's accessible. We need more uh, good writers uh, to tell Ukraine's story, uh, you know, in, in simple English. Um, now's the moment for that. I think there's a great book to be written about President Zelensky as well. Uh, could you say a little bit more about him? So he's been in power for, uh, he came to power in, in 99, or in, sorry, in, in 2019, uh, and he was elected with 73%. He was a comedian, no political experience. And I, I would say he didn't do very well for the first two years. And now he's the hero of the world. What have you observed about him? Are, are you surprised at the transformation? It's quite uh, difficult to answer because I'm not thinking about the actual context in this um, with these words. I'm not thinking, uh, for example, about uh, our president uh, as something divided from the actual uh, war context. Maybe uh, Ukrainian army and our army forces are more important. And I'm very conscious that our army is the force helping me, for example, to have this conversation with you. Yeah. Thanks to them, I have the possibility to be in this quiet, uh, uh, between these quiet walls in our newsrooms of the Ukrainian radio, of our public broadcasts in Ukraine. And thanks to them, I have the possibility to, to work as a radio presenter. So uh, speaking about myself and about my personal opinion, it, um, it's my main perspective to thinking about uh, the actual war context. And of course, I appreciate a lot uh, all these quite brilliant speeches of Zelensky. For example, the speech um, for the United States or another one uh, in France. I think it's very interesting um, in messages and also about tackling the interesting historical perspective of these countries. And it's very interesting to see how uh, they are working with it. Absolutely. He's got a great speechwriter. He has a great feel for people. Um, and they've done a brilliant job at crafting messages uh, that appeal to the, the hearts of British parliamentarians or American parliamentarians. So yeah, I, 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 think, I think you're totally right. Another interesting point you just raised is that trust in the Ukrainian army is sky high. You know, before uh, Putin came in on the 24th for the second time, uh, the, the Ukrainian army was very, very trusted. And I expect its numbers to be, uh, you know, through the roof, as we say uh, in, in American English. Uh, you know, one of the big heroes and one person we don't know very much about is, is your general. Could, could you say a little bit more about the, the general in charge of this whole operation? I'm not, and maybe it's natural because <laughs> maybe there are some things uh, we are not supposed to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, no, not supposed to talk, maybe it would be more precise. Okay, well, I mean, that's an interesting point. The, the fact that you don't even have very much to say about the general in charge shows that he's low key, he's doing his job, he's very capable. Um, and I think that there's a story finally in English about him, but you know, he's not very well known here. Uh, and he's 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 performed very brilliantly. Um, he also got a lot of experience fighting in the Donbass over the last eight years. So you know, that's part of the reason why he's so capable. I think but, it's very it's very natural to have this uh, belief in the Ukrainian army. As you mentioned, um, in the Ukraine, uh, there is a lot of trust in the army, but also in the Ukrainian volunteers. Since 2014, uh, is, uh, there is a lot of people trusting Ukrainian volunteers and such uh, funds like uh, Povrmis Zhvin, founded by Vitaly Deneka, and now it is uh, working with another executive director, and they are fundraising a big amount uh, of money. And I think it's very important to have them as an efficient power to help and to provide help to our um, army. This, this is the Come Back Alive Foundation, right? Yeah, yeah I, I think that's an important story to tell. So Come Back Alive Foundation started in 2014 and it was started by a computer programmer who had nothing to do with politics. His entire goal in life was to ride a motorbike in Asia. Uh, he was not interested in politics, but he saw uh, he saw Vladimir Putin and his little green men annex Crimea and then try to take the Donbass. And he said, I have to do something about this. He was chain smoking uh, uh, in his apartment on the left bank in Kiev. And he said, I can, I can help. And he started raising money. He was an engineer, computer engineer. 
and he started and he's really good at it and he's really charismatic uh, and he's, he's a fabulous story. His name is Vitaly Denega. And uh, I've written about him a lot and know him and really respect him. But he started the Come Back Alive Foundation. It's become an enormous charity, well-trusted. It's raised millions of grivna uh, to buy equipment for the Ukrainian uh, armed forces since 2014. In 2014, when the armed forces went out to the Donbass, they didn't have uniforms. They didn't have real equipment. So Ukrainian, Ukrainian civil society, or, ordinary people saw this and said, God, we got to do something about this. And that's one of the most amazing things that I will never get over is how resourceful Ukrainians are, it is that they see a problem and they fix it themselves. They don't sit around and wait uh, for the state to fix it. And it's one of the reasons why I, I am very optimistic about Ukraine's future. Thank you, Olha, for the opportunity to have this great discussion. Arena, can't wait to meet you in person. Uh, God bless you and keep you. And we'll keep our eye uh, on everything that, that, that you write and that you say on air. Thank you, Melinda. Yeah, I would add to meet you. <laughs> I think that you have a lot to discuss even after our conversation as well. And this is what I wanted to add that the Ukraine example is probably the best example of a real civil society when we really don't need the state effort just to organize things. I can I can just prove it even with the uh, last week London Book Fair when the governmental institution couldn't come there. So I just, in a week term, I organized a group of volunteers and we performed brilliantly. <laughs> and uh, that I couldn't stand but prepared a couple of books to show you while you were discussing about that. We are just back from the London Book Fair. My apartment is all loaded with Ukrainian books. I was trying to pick the most important ones, but obviously failed, as you can see. <laughs> It's very difficult to find the most important, but two on feminism that, for example, Oksana Zabushko, yes, it's your and could go here, and also another Oksana, Oksana Kiss, survival as a victory. This is also very important about the Ukrainian women in Gulag, and probably another, another name for Ukraine, survival as a victory, the story of our lives. And here you have a second Ukrainian woman feminist, as I'm echoing Irida's word. <laughs> we were, we have very strong tradition of feminism as well. And but best historical introductions, I absolutely agree with you that this is Sergei Pohi, and he has such a lot of amazing books. And not only Gates of Europe, but the front line. Yeah, this one can be absolutely recommended. And the one you were just mentioning something about the future of the past. <laughs> This is a brilliant overview and analysis of Ukraine finding itself in the middle of the you know, worst international crisis and how it can proceed after the Cold War. But also books of our pen cases. Oleg Sinsov, Stas Asiev, or some books like Permanent Revolution, Another Story of Ukraine by Elisa Voshkina. And if you are talking about the, about the fiction, here is obviously Andrei Kukov. He's well-known and translated a lot and his black humor and a bit of surrealism of the post sovieticus uh, you know, uh, lifestyle. It's something really to discover and to understand now. Or young Ukrainian writers like Andrei Lupka Karabit, and we have, I have a lot here. <laughs> so honestly, uh, this is exactly what we all can take from those conversations. Deeper understanding, original knowledge, and some answers to the question, what can I do to help? And today, probably a bit unexpected, I would say, enjoy. Enjoy Ukrainian culture renaissance, discover rich traditional culture, but also act, translate, share, and help us to survive. I want to remind you about the Helena Struk fundraising initiative aiming to purchase of drugs and tactical medicine for field hospitals, vital for Ukrainians who are protecting themselves and their country today. You can find all the details in the comments and please donate to help today. Russia's war on Ukraine is not fiction, but time to act. So choose your way. We are grateful to our partners for today's event, Atlantic Council, Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute, and the Harman Institute at Columbia University. And for all the cross streaming services on all the partners page. Gratitude, of course, to Pan Ukraine, which continues to stand at the front lines in the name of freedom and truth. 
And Pan International is proud to be a platform that supports freedom of expression. We don't necessarily agree with each word said, but this is not the case for today's episode, for sure. <laughs> Follow our dialogues. You will find all the updates about the further dialogues on our Facebook pages. Spread the word and stand with Ukraine. This is our shared responsibility today. Thank you.